this month, we're going to be talking about a lot about drone laws. We're going to be talking about private property issues, property uh, airspace issues, things of that nature. We've got a long list of questions that we're going to be talking about. And hopefully, we're going to actually spin this uh, conversation and topics of discussion. We're going to talk about it over probably two to three different Prod, uh, podcast because there is a lot of information that we're going to talk about right here. So uh, right now, I'm very happy to present uh, to you guys as Jan I. Siegel. Jan I. and I met over probably about, uh, would you say it's about a year ago, and um, we were both going to be guest presenters um, to a uh, lawyer convention. So Jan I um, is the current chairman of the Aeronautical and Space uh, Law Section of the PA Bar Association. He's also corporate counsel for over 25 years and also with the law firm of Schaefer Glazer. Would that, uh, did I get all that correct? <laughs> you did indeed. Okay, great. So, uh, Jan and I, why don't we at first, uh, let's talk about putting out a huge disclaimer right now. So uh, for everybody watching this podcast, uh, we are not uh, the expert aviation lawyers. Everything that we're going to be talking about is very gray areas. Um, there's nothing as far as being finite, definite things that we're going to be talking about. But we are going to talk about very specific things that are going to be extremely interesting extremely knowledgeable to everybody but you know we are not your lawyer and nothing that we say should be taken into any content that we're actually giving anybody lawyer advice uh would you would you want to add anything on to that yeah um uh, let me repeat that we are not your lawyers and we're not giving anyone anyone legal advice as to what to do we're giving you our views on a number of subjects that generate the most questions if you have any legal questions regarding any of uh, the topics we're discussing regarding your own drone operations, please consult an attorney with experience in this area. We'll be happy to field your, dis your questions for further discussion on the general group, but we're not your lawyers. Uh, these issues, though, are pervasive. They're covering a huge number of areas that no one ever expected. And uh, they're all good questions. Uh, for our audience, here's the things that we're going to be discussing today. As a drone operator, can I fly over private property without the owner's permission? Who owns the airspace from the ground up? Is there truly private airspace? What jurisdiction and property rights do property owners have? Can a property owner sue you if they prove you're flying over their house? If so, on what grounds? And does it matter if you don't take off or land over a specific private property? What is the FAA's jurisdiction for airspace? Why does the FAA think it can regulate from the blades of grass all the way up? So those are the things that we're going to be talking about and going over. And we'll just jump right into it on the very first question. Um, so with that said... As a drone operator, can I fly over private property without the owner's permission? What say you? And the answer is, it depends. The law is complex. And uh, when you pose that question at the advanced drone law seminar that the uh, PBI and PBA aerospace, uh, aeronautical and space law section yeah. had uh, put together back in 2018, you had a half dozen lawyers on the phone all grown because it is the question and it is a very political one. So let me demystify it and go over the basics. Bottom line is uh, there's a long history to this. It starts back in 1926 when Congress enacted legislation to establish a public right of freedom of transit in air commerce through navigable airspace. The uh, statute is 49 U.S. Code Section 40103. In Section A, Part 1, the United States government has exclusive sovereignty 
of airspace of the United States. And in Section 2, a citizen of the United States has a public right of transit through navigable airspace. Now, the question is, if you've got a public right of transit through navigable airspace, why do you need permission? And that's because Congress didn't have the last word. Back in 1946, actually 40, 1946 was when the U.S. Supreme Court rendered a decision. The case actually happened during World War II. Uh, the case of U.S. versus Cosby, also known as the chicken farmer case, came about. The U.S. Supreme Court does have a say over what Congress passes. And some facts about the case, you had a chicken farmer who in uh, owned a chicken farm outside of Greensboro, North Carolina. The farm was located near an airport that the U.S. military took over. And according to Cosby, the noise from the airport regularly frightened the animals on his farm, resulting in the deaths of several chickens. So they sued. They sued the U.S. government under the takings clause of the U.S. Constitution, saying, you've effectively taken my property. The U.S. government's response was, this is a temporary air base. This isn't a taking. You'll get it back. It went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which decided that there was a taking, that uh, landowners have rights above their property. In fact, uh, one of the best phrases I've got, if the landowner, and this is from the U.S. Supreme Court opinion, if the landowner is to have full enjoyment of his land, he must have exclusive control over the immediate reaches of the enveloping atmosphere. Now, I encourage everyone to actually take a look and read through this opinion. It wasn't written just for lawyers. It was written for pilots. It was written for everyone. And it stood for the last 72 years because it was so clearly written. And uh, I'll forward you a link that hopefully you can post that people can look up and read this for themselves because there's so many different analyses out there and but, how they're slanted depends on what conclusions they want to reach. The bottom line is, as a landowner, they have a right for some amount of airspace over their property. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1946 said 500 feet, more or less, we're not being specific because technology changes. The underlying fact is, as the landowner, you control the airspace right over your home. Otherwise, if you didn't, you'd need a federal permit to put up a fence or plant a tree or to put up a second story. Well, because well, that's all airspace. Let me stop you right there for one second. So I have a question for you. And then, sure. it, because it's really important to clarify to our audience a few very important things. In this reading, it, like, it's, like you mentioned, now you're saying 500 feet or thereabout, but it really isn't saying any specific uh, altitude number. So my question to you is, why do you say approximately 500 feet as it, because there's nothing specifically that says anything? Why? What makes you assume that it's closer to 500 than, let's say, 700 or 200 even? Excellent question, Dave. The answer is that back in 1946, the Civil Aeronautics Board, which was a precursor to the FAA, had prescribed that aircraft should not fly under 500 feet. Um, in fact, it was under 1,000 feet in congested area, 500 over rural areas. Um, and consequently, the U.S. Supreme Court fastened on that as saying, well, if you can't fly under 500 feet, uh, except for takeoffs and landings, then clearly the area below 500 feet is not navigable airspace. Therefore, we're going to look at that as the non-navigable airspace that is the purvey of the landowner. Now, in practice, since then, we've developed helicopters, we've developed drones. We can navigate in that airspace. But... Where does the landowner's rights to his own personal airspace end and federal jurisdiction begin? Mm -hmm. That question in 72 years has not been settled. But U.S. v. Cosby is still good law. 
courts are still citing it as recently as uh, 2016 in uh, my last reading in Hartford, Connecticut, where there was a traffic accident yes. in the middle of uh, the city. A uh, newspaper reporter uh, apparently took a break, drove his drone downtown to the accident scene, which had been roped off by police, flew his drone at 150 feet over the accident scene, but inside the area that had been roped off. The police ordered his drone out of the sky, hassled him, and uh, some of the other facts in the case is Phelps v. Rivera. We'll go into greater detail in a later talk, but bottom line was, it came to the judge, uh, and the federal judge ruled that at 150 feet, he was inside the airspace that the police had asserted control over. It was as if he was walking on the ground itself. And since the ground had been roped off, the drone was trespassing on a crime scene. Now, to the same extent that some st states have softened the aerial trespass with a separate doctrine uh, where maybe you can legitimately fly through somebody's airspace over somebody's home, uh, some lawyers maintain that that's a proper reading of U.S. v. Cosby. Others say that it's a twisted reading and will argue at every opportunity they get. Which doctrine your state follows will change state by state. It's not set at the federal level. Mm -hmm. So that's really important of a distinction to make for our drone operators that are out there that are probably, a lot of them saying, so you're trying to tell me that a 1946 case is having the precedence over what we're doing today. Well, to amplify on that, and lawyers do that, mm -hmm. the uh, idea that you can fly anywhere is based on a law passed in 1926. The U.S. Supreme Court partially limited that in 1946, and nothing has happened to restrain that or alter that in any way. In fact, when Part 107 was released by the FAA, there is in the commentary clear responses that to questions posed that indicated that the Part 107 was not intended to be a federal preemption of all state legislation governing activities over uh, land. Uh, mm -hmm. The FAA specifically disclaimed preemption. Let's assume I fly over someone's private property and they don't like that. And I didn't even take off or land over that property. Are you telling me that a, an, a, a property owner can make a case against that? Absolutely. Let's take drones out of the picture. Let's, let's use something completely different. You've got um, a home with a backyard with a neighbor to your left and a neighbor to the right. You've got a fence up because you don't get along so well with your neighbors. And your neighbors decide on a day that you're having a barbecue that they are going to annoy you by throwing a football over your fence from one side over to the property on the other side. So the ball never touches the ground on your property. They're just throwing the football from one side to the other. Is that trespass? Guess what? Yes, it is. Trespass, nuisance, the specific claim is going to depend on your state law, but that's what it is in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and it's a claim, and it's a claim against you if you own the football. Now, you make a really good point that we should just maybe just touch really quickly that we can go into further, um, because what makes this so confusing is that you know, there's three different laws here, I mean, or three different uh, hi hierarchies. You have federal government, you have your state government, and then you have your local municipalities. And what right. what what makes it so uh, turns it into so gray and, or confusing um, is the fact that the local municipalities want to try to make their own drone rules, and this, you have the states wanting to make their own drone rules, and then you have the federal government saying not so fast. <laughs> so you want to t touch base on that this a, a little bit? Sure. Well, you've got the same thing every time you get behind the wheel of your car. When you operate your car, some of the provisions that you operate under are federal law. The rest are governed by your state uh, motor vehicle statutes, 
And then you have local ordinances where stop signs, red lights, right turn on red. These are all laws that using that same three levels, we live with every day. Guess what? Same thing applies to drone law. And when you're operating a drone, you need to be cognizant of the laws that you're operating under. So let's say I live in South Dakota. How, as a drone operator, can I find out what South Dakota's laws are? How difficult is it to research and, and find out? Most of these laws, they're statutes. They're published. They're easily accessible, and they can be researched without act resorting to specialized legal databases. What some states have done is they've split the question of jurisdiction. Uh, they'll say that for that area that is below the altitude that the Federal Aviation Authority has jurisdiction over, the, the state asserts the following regulations. Mm -hmm. So we don't know where that altitude is. Nobody wants to set that altitude, and there's, and there's a reason for that. It's because if somebody sets the altitude and then gets sued because you're taking away some of their property rights, yeah. They may find themselves, uh, the government may find themselves having to pay for taking away someone's rights. Gotcha. Nobody wants to pay for it. That's the bottom line here. That's why the law hasn't changed in 72 years. Probably the most basic question I get from my students is they ask me, so with all this drone law buzz, What's the worst thing that can happen to me if a property owner wants, uh, is, sees my drone over their property and is not happy about it? Can they, can they call the police? Can they have me arrested? Um, can the police confiscate my equipment? Um, or can they file uh, a civil suit against me? Can they do both? You know, those are the kind of questions that I get that are the most common. What do you think? And the answer is all of the above. Uh, in Pennsylvania in particular, under the new model drone law, or the new uh, Criminal Drone Act, the uh, penalty ascribed in the act itself is a monetary penalty. However, it references a law which includes jail time at the discretion of the judge. So if somebody complains, calls the police, the police officer could arrest you, and a judge could put you in jail. So, the other thing that is civil lawsuits. Somebody can sue you for trespass, invasion of privacy, even potentially nuisance, depending on the state statutes. Um, these, these are all areas that you need to be aware of. But underlying all of that, just as a matter of business practice, just think of what your customer is seeing when you're operating your drone. Yeah. A neighbor comes out and calls the police, and all of a sudden you're in a shouting match with a police officer. Uh, that doesn't look good, and it certainly doesn't help foster uh, new business. Mm -hmm. They don't want to. Right. It's a matter of good business practice. Exactly. So I learned a long, long time ago. You know, so I've been flying drones for 10 years now. And when I first started out, there was no. Drones weren't even called drones back then, and you couldn't even buy them on a shelf. So when we started flying like this, we would get a very, very defensive reaction. But then I started at that point becoming very proactive. So when I would go out, I would go to all the surrounding houses that I know that I would have to fly over and knock on their door and simply to say, hey, here's what I'm doing. Here's who I am. Did you leave your business card? Yes, I would give business cards. It's and then, an opportunity. And then, and then that turned also into having my cell phone have an app where I would have them sign, you know, a little a waiver on there. And but you know, Excellent. out of the, you know, thousands of flights that I have done, or you know, the the, the people that I've talked to in ten years, that, can you believe I have never had one person tell me, no, I don't want you flying my over my home when you ask them in advance. But when they see your drone over their house and they have no idea what it's capable of doing or who's, who's operating it or why, I mean, I've gone out and actually have had to knock on up to 10 different doors mm -hmm. for one job. And that can almost take almost an hour. 
you know, and I know a lot of joint operators are saying to themselves, I'm not spending an extra hour just to get permission on a job. But you have to weigh all the pros and cons. And you have to remember, too, is that, like you're mentioning, especially if your clients are there, the last thing you're going to want to see is the police rolling up. And then you have to explain to the police what you're doing and or having a very aggressive neighbor or property owner come out and basically, you know, going out there and they can threaten you and a, and a lot more. So this, it's they could take a pot shot at your drone. You really don't want that to happen. But let me go one step further, if I may. How much time do you, as a professional drone operator, spend marketing your business? Exactly. That hour you just spent going around the neighborhood, getting permission from all the neighbors, that's also a sales call. Treat it as a sales call because, you know what? They may want to have you do something over their property, too. And if you're kind, considerate, explain yourself well, and least of all, surprise them. No surprises. Let them know. Then you may generate more business just by doing the right thing. You know, let's talk a little bit about law enforcement. Let's assume, let's make the assumption that a neighbor or a property owner calls the police on a joint operator and they have to respond. You know, there are 5,000 different ways to Sunday on how that how that police officer is going to handle that call and or what they're going to do. Um, you know, I have personally seen many instances myself, and I have seen where it's and the reactions were from everything where the, 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 you know, the police officer thought it was the coolest thing known to man. And they wanted to basically just ask you a ton of different things and get a lot more information because they, they're so interested. Or I've actually seen police officers actually confiscate the, the camera or force the drone operator to show the police officer the content that's on the, on the camera card. So, and or simply enough, they're just going to be able to haul you down and ask questions later. So it can be in anything in between that. And that's the, what's the most important part is because, you know, really, to be honest with you, police officers don't have a consistent knowledge base on what yeah. to do. Well, that's exactly what happened in Hartford, Connecticut. The police seized the drone. Yeah. Now, consider this from the police enforcement perspective. Somebody calls in with a complaint, they're going to dispatch the closest available officer who could be a young buck fresh out of school who is trying to make a good impression, has somebody who has filed a complaint, and they're going to come on scene and they want to restore order. They also may want to assert their authority, and they may not have the first clue what the law is going to be. So how do you defuse that situation? By dealing with it in advance. Yeah. If your drone flight might interfere with a municipal function, such as uh, line inspections by the local utility company, if there's going to be helicopters flying overhead, you may not be aware of it, but your local law enforcement will be. So bottom line is it just makes good business sense to contact your local police department for the job site and uh, at least apprise them when and where you're going to be operating and what the nature of your mission will be. That way, when there's a call and somebody rolls, uh, they'll get briefed by somebody at their dispatch desk, this is what's going on. Or worse yet, if they don't get the dispatch, you can tell the police officer with your customer at your shoulder, please call, please call into your office, this has already been pre-approved. So. I guess now let's go ahead and go to the second question, which is, what is the FAA's jurisdiction? And that is the huge question. Can the FAA authorize you to fly in what is arguably navigable airspace from the, great, the blades of grass on up? And the answer is, it depends. And it depends <laughs> on state law. Not anything the FAA has said. Now, why is the FAA asserting or attempting to assert jurisdiction down to the blades of grass? It's because the FAA was charged in uh, 2012 as part of the 2012 FAA Reauthorization Act by Congress 
with the safe integration of UAS operations into the national airspace system. This is why Part 107 flights are under 400 feet. That's because manned aircraft, with the exception of helicopters on a limited scale, uh, planes are operating at 500 feet and above. So that's going to give you a clear 100-foot buffer between where you can be flying and where airplanes are supposed to be flying. Uh, helicopters may go lower, but the regulation says they can only do so if they can do so safely. And it doesn't mean that helicopters get a free, a free pass to fly anywhere they want. Uh, it's just proven difficult to prove and prosecute a case against the helicopter pilot or even a low-flying plane because you got to snap the tail number. you got to estimate the altitude. The FAA actually maintains a website where uh, you can post these things, but uh, in practice, enforcement has been very difficult. It isn't unless uh, the plane puts down or the uh, helicopter touches down, and you get uh, a clear indication of what altitude they're at and who's flying it. Now, the FAA does not have jurisdiction over state claims for trespass, invasion of privacy, or nuisance, which mm -hmm. could be noise pollution, could be you know dust, it could be a host of things. It's all again, that's all defined by your state statutes. May even have some municipal statutes. So, can the FAA regulate from blades of grass on up? Yes and no. The FAA can tell you how to safely fly a drone but they cannot prevent you from being sued or arrested under state law. Furthermore, there's this another case from Connecticut where maybe at very low altitudes, the FAA may arguably not have jurisdiction if, it, if you're flying at just about 10 feet or so. Um, think about it. If you have a jalopy in your yard that's not street legal or a dirt bike or something, that you can't take out on the roads, but you got a really big property. You can drive it on your property all you like. Uh, you don't even need a driver's license because it's your land. It's your property. You're not interfering with anybody else. Um, you're, you don't need a driver's license for it. Well, at what point, at what altitude can you fly an experimental drone without the FAA levying fines against you? In the flamethrower case out of Connecticut, that was where the judge was going uh, in the uh, preliminary hearings to the trial, yeah. asking the FAA to prove that they actually had jurisdiction over a drone that was flying at about 8, 10 feet above ground. You can see clearly on the uh, video that it posted to YouTube mm -hmm. that didn't harm any neighbors and didn't violate any state laws. The FAA declined to pursue that. Yeah. Well, another thing, too, is that, you know, I know some joint operators are right now thinking to themselves, well, if the FAA doesn't necessarily have jurisdiction to the most extreme extent, like you're saying, why do I need a FAA license and why do I have to pay all this money and, 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 and get a uh, knowledge, taking all this time to get a knowledge test and everything? Well, for the, the various reasons that you, as a professional, you want to be able to do everything the correct way. And that's the only way you're going to get insurance to protect yourself and your client. Because, and this goes back to, you know, where joint operators say, well, there's no joint police out there. I'm just going to go out and violate the FAA rules and regulations anyway. Well, my thought is, yes, there is no drone police out there necessarily, but if you have an accident and you either don't have your li don't have that license or you're violating the, the rules and regulations of the 107 licensing, then you're definitely you know your insurance company is not going to cover that. And if you have a serious accident that involves serious injury or worse or you know or uh, you know property damage or that nature. You're, they're not going to cover that, and you're going to you're going to be on the hook for that. And I've seen many joint operators not have a penny to their name, and there's been accidents, and um, you know the property owners had to go sue the joint operator, and then when the joint operator doesn't have the money, they go after the person that hired them and their clients. 
So that's the biggest thing as, a, you know, my advice to the audience is that as a drone operator, it's your responsibility to protect your clients at the utmost extreme. So that's why, if nothing else, if that's the kind of the, if, if, if you're thinking that kind of a way going down that rabbit hole, um, that's, that's why you definitely should make sure that you have the FAA license and more so that why you have to follow the rules and regulations. One very important caveat I have to mention, and that is if you're a business that has general liability coverage, your general liability coverage will not cover your drone operations. Absolutely. Drones are aircraft, and um, in the first case of its type out in California, um, a videographer, uh, wedding videographer accidentally flew a drone into yeah. somebody's face, blinding one of the guests, and asserted a claim under the uh, general liability policy, comm commercial uh, CGL policy, yeah. with Philadelphia indemnity, and the California court discharged the case because all they had was the general liability, general business liability coverage. They did not have an aviation clause, an aircraft clause, and it was clearly excluded. And now the company is facing a multi-million dollar lawsuit mm -hmm. without insurance. So, yeah, Jan, I, uh, I guess the last question that we'll cover in this podcast is, um, can a property owner shoot down your drone? And the answer is, well, if their aim is really good, but uh, please don't try. People have gone to jail for this in New Jersey and California in a couple of incidents where a drone operator uh, shot and missed the drone, but did not miss the neighbor on the far side of the property. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. Yeah. Um, that was in uh, the California and New Jersey. They did get the drone. However, shotgun shells spread. They were picking shotgun pellets out of the front door of the far neighbor's property. And then it turned out that the drone operator uh, who had been operating the drone over a construction site, had the property owner's permission to operate over that site. And it was the neighbor shooting into the, into the construction site's yard that was intruding, completely in the wrong, went to jail. So well, what that said is then why is, in some cases, it, uh, why is it okay well, or why has the you know why did the uh, the person that actually fired the shot not gone to jail in some situations and and yet in some situations they have? Well, in Kentucky, um, in what appears to be uh, uh, a fairly unique case, uh, the accounts varied tremendously, and since it went went up before a the equivalent of a municipal court, there's not a lot of court record out there whether it was as the drone operator asserted that they were flying at 180 feet. There are other witness uh, testimony that there wasn't just one overflight, but multiple overpasses at much lower flights, including hovering over the swimming pool where his teenage daughter was uh, sunning herself in a bikini. Um, the, uh, the landowner who fired and hit the drone was not prosecuted for discharge of firearms. And as far as the damage to the drone, uh, the judge ruled that he had every right to shoot the drone down. Now, when it went up for appeal, I don't think that the uh, appeal brief argued the case particularly effectively, but uh, the court basically threw the case out. Yeah. So uh, as the drone operator, zero recourse. So well, if you turn that situation around, suppose you have an angry neighbor pull out a shotgun. Um, if you'd already knocked on their door and talked about it ahead of time, yes, then you should have a waiver or at least uh, a record of the meeting that, hey, look, they were okay with your operating. If you coordinated with law enforcement, you're going to be the one who's calling the police saying, here I am doing my lawful business and somebody just pulled out a shotgun and threatened me and my uh, drone, my aircraft, yeah. with it, much less fired and hit. So you would much prefer to be on the right side of the law 
with the support of local law enforcement if a neighbor starts getting hostile. Uh, Jan, I, I got a question for you. Well, what if someone just threatens you that they're going to shoot it down? Call 911. Get the police there because somebody who's discharging a firearm in your vicinity, there's probably laws against it. In fact, there usually are. Yeah. So uh, do not try to handle the situation yourself. Consider yourself under threat and respond accordingly. Ground the drone, end your activities, call the police. Mm -hmm. Let the police come on scene, restore order, and then, if you can, proceed with uh, your mission, which is to shoot the video footage generally that you intended to do. Great information again. i very happy with exactly everything that we've been able to cover today. So let's that helps. Talk, helps. Yeah, let's talk about a little bit what we're going to do uh, for the next episode. So for the next episode, we're going to talk a lot more about the private airspace rights and navigation easements over adjacent private properties. And we're talk about the PA drone law attempts to provide some safe harbors for drone operations. And uh, also we'll try to cover, you know, some other states as well. Or we'll talk about the contrast from state to state. We'll talk about the federal, state, municipality, air straight, airspace, jurisdiction issues, and the latest uh, from the Uniform Law Committee on Drone Torts. Uh, we'll talk about privacy, trespass, and nuance issues. Uh, we'll talk about, the, and again, this is the, the big one that everyone's uh, buzzing about, the 2018 FAA Reauthorization Act and the coming licensing of recreational drone pilots. And um, after all that, what I'd like to do, and hopefully we can try to cover that um, in a, a one, one more p podcast. And then it would be very cool um, for us to be able to open up um, a forum for the audience to be able to ask questions. And then we could spend, you know, we could use a third podcast to take and answer all the questions that we get. So I think that would be a good game plan to go with. Certainly. And uh, thank you very much. I hope this helps. Um any uh, existing or would-be uh, commercial drone pilots operate safely. Uh, let's try and keep things uh, on the safe side out there. And look at this as a marketing opportunity because at the end of the day, uh, there's no percentage in um, ticking off potential customers. Thanks, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. If you like this video and like to see more free videos in the future, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And while you're at it, if you're interested in free lessons on how to fly drones, discounts on drone equipment, discounts on insurance, or access to our exclusive drone video library, check out our website, steelcityflightacademy.com.